Get ready for a whole new experience at this year's Festival of Homiletics in person and online, May 16th to 20th. Join us in Denver, Colorado, or online from wherever you are. This year's theme is After the Storm, Preaching and Trauma. And it will feature Otis Moss III, Nadia Boltz Weber, Robert Wright, and Raphael Warnock. This year, the festival will draw up to 1,200 colleagues in person and thousands more online for preaching, worship, and dialogue to help you develop a hands on way to engage trauma in your own ministry context. Other speakers include William Barber II, Anna Carter Florence, Lauren Winner, Emily and Amelia Nagoski, and many more. Make plans for this incredible learning experience with top teachers. Join us in Denver or online. Go to www.festivalofhomiletics.com for registration and details. Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Rolf Jacobson. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. Uh, this is the podcast for January 30th, 2022, the fourth Sunday after the Epiphany. The, uh, the Old Testament lesson is Jeremiah 1, 4 through 10. Uh, Psalm 71, verses 1 through 6, 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 13, and Luke 4, 21 through 30. So as we mentioned last week, anticipating this Sunday, here we get the response to the sermon of Jesus in Nazareth. Hometown boy comes back, and uh, let's see how he did. And while the initial response is amazement and, uh, and wonder, and then things don't go so well. So then the response is, uh, let's throw Jesus off of a cliff. And so just to think a little bit about what I, I was suggesting last week and talking about last week, that Jesus' ministry is calling forth a, a, a response, a reaction. What is how, what is going to be our response to what Jesus has to say? And I and I, I find that also to be a, a helpful way to think about to Epiphany. I think sometimes, uh, maybe this is not entirely true. I don't want to generalize here, but sometimes I think of Epiphany, or the way in which people talk about Epiphany, is is kind of reveling in those Epiphanous uh, moments can only use that word now for three more Sundays or whatever. So I'm going to try to get it in as many times as I can, but that reveling in that amazement epiphanous moment of, of what's being revealed and which is fine. But what, what this text calls us to remember is that epiphanies are also moments of, of response and interpretation and moments of what does this mean? Uh, what is this revealing about Jesus? What am I going to do with this epiphany? And so I think first and foremost, that's the that's one thing I'd like to remind preachers or maybe one direction, homiletical direction on a larger liturgical scale of you know the church season is to say, what do we do with these epiphanies? What do we do with uh, what what God reveals to us and and what Jesus is revealing about? himself and God's, uh, the nature of God's kingdom. And so what does that, what does that look like? What is that? What are, what are we, what are we doing and what are we saying in response to that? First thought, I have some other thoughts, but I'll stop there. Yeah. I like the approach on the, the approach from the perspective of revealing and epiphany. And this is a text that means so much in so many settings, but to start there, and to ask the question, what is Jesus revealing about himself? Who is spotting it? How are they spotting it? <laughs> as well as how they respond to it. It makes me think one of the things that, that drives me crazy in some church settings when people want to talk about how is God speaking to you in this text, right? Or what do you, what do you sense, you know, God saying or lifting up to you in this text uh, are usually, um, that's not the way I want to go about it. I want to know what God is saying to my neighbor about it. So I always want to know, you know what I mean? It's less when, when people narrate that in the first person and more when you're in a setting where people are working hard to speak for uh, people who aren't necessarily in the room. And some of the ways that's what's going on here is that Jesus has revealed something about himself. Everybody's amazed. And now he's the one who actually provokes the hostility here. He's like, you all are going to say to me, you know, doctor, cure yourself, right? If you've got all these great 
solutions to the world's problems, why don't you fix things on your own first or fix things here at home because Nazareth is nice and all that, but we're really uh, not where we need to be. We're kind of underpaid. We're kind of exploited labor. And, you know, so it'd be really great if you could help out here. And Jesus says, you know, this makes me think of Elijah and Elisha. It makes me think of these other opportunities. I mean, one of the things that he's doing here, I think he's saying to, to the hometown crowd that his good news is going to bestow no special rights upon them or no special privileges upon them. Uh, it's remember the Isaiah quotes. This is a gospel that primarily is for their neighbor. And that's that's good news to everybody, I think, but in a kind of sequence or in a kind of priority or in a kind of way that requires us to follow Jesus through this story, to see who he collects around him and to see how he dies and to see how he then commissions his followers. And so it's it's also a hard revealing, but I think it's any any sermon on this has got to deal with why is everybody so upset here but that's part of it that mm -hmm. beware of expecting a special benefit or a special prerogative uh, for yourself and in this case because they're the hometown he's their guy well i think that's part of part of the interesting dynamic here is that that's exactly who he is he's the hometown guy that's the assumption because the first response is, is not this Joseph's son? Well, and of course the reader knows, oh, well, actually back in the baptism, no, he's God's son. <laughs> uh, and of. well, yeah, kind of, but, but, but you know what I mean by that is that they're, the way in which their, their response is in response to who do they assume Jesus is and, and, how is it they are interpreting even his own identity? And which is, which is an interesting question homiletically and for a life of faith is that, that who, you, who you assume Jesus to be will often dictate your positive or negative or whatever on the spectrum response to what Jesus has to say. And so if you, if, if you think of Jesus as a particular kind of way and what Jesus has to say lines up with that, then that works. But if it doesn't, then that's cause for a little bit of uh, disruption in one's life. And uh, uh, earlier, uh, the, several weeks ago, uh, Rolf and I did a recording a podcast on our Working Preacher Books podcast with Brent Strawn, who has a, he's an author on our Working Preacher Books series. It's called Honest to God Preaching. And we were talking about this really interesting, uh, interesting dynamic of preaching that I often will mention in my, in my preaching, well, always mention in my preaching class that the response to what you have to say <laughs> in your sermon, we have a tendency to take that so personal, tendency to take that so personally, like, oh, they didn't like what I said. Well, what they probably didn't like is what the what the text had to say and and you know so blame it on or take it up with isaiah i uh, i wonder if jesus said to some of the crowd <laughs> take it up with i didn't say it take it up with isaiah or take it up take it up with luke uh, this, that the that the response is i think it's a it's a moment for preachers to re remember that and recognize that too you know the jesus first sermon uh didn't go over so well and that the and and we were talking about on the podcast that Will Willimon said to Brent that that uh, you know it used to be that it, it you know that things that you would say from the pulpit you would kind of know where the negative responses would be or things that, that that would cause some strife or disruption or uncomfortable you know uncomfortableness. Now all you have to do is read the Sermon on the Mount and people can't stand it. And so just the, just the way in which, you know, we're, we're, we're really, but it, it's a call, I think, to lock ourselves into uh, these, these passages and preaching, preaching them for all they're worth and saying, yeah, yeah, this is, you know, this is, I'm not making this up. This is right here. And, uh, and it's a call for maybe ongoing conversation about, again, one's response to, uh, and, and a community is, as you said, response to these texts. Well, uh, one thing I don't understand, and that is verse 23, the first half of verse 23. He said to them, doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, doctor, cure yourself. What? I don't get that. I get the second part. Hey, do some of those miracles you did in Capernaum. Let's see those. That makes sense to me. But what? what's the doctor, cure yourself? 
Well, the hard part of the second part is he hasn't been to Capernaum yet. So there's that as well. That'll come next. So the doctor cure yourself. I, I've heard pretty much two different things. One, it's either them saying to him, uh, you know, take care of yourself first. We don't need any more preachers in this town. You know, that before you want to come and make these grand promises, get your own life in order first or take care of your own stuff would be more dismissive the other one is more of the sense of for a doctor to be effective that doctor has to be healthy therefore jesus has a particular obligation to his hometown to fix things here first before he imagines that it's his job to go off somewhere else and help other people got it that makes more sense i believe if i haven't looked this up recently but i think i don't think there is reference to this being a known proverb at the time but i don't remember for sure nobody quote me on that but there isn't a long lost P source. Yeah, there you go. But this, he's yeah, the one who provoked like saying, doubtless this is going to happen. I mean, what he's trying to get at is I think this, yeah. no prophet is welcome in their hometown. And in a way, Luke has to prove that to be true in a book that's so committed to prophecy or to prophet as the main identifier for what kind of Messiah Jesus is. And of course, that will get played out in Jerusalem as well when the city becomes kind of as a whole, it feels like united against him and has to reject him. But I think too, let me say one more thing, but let me say one quick thing about this is this is a text that often figures into so many conversations about whether Luke's gospel is, is anti-Jewish or imagines the church as replacing Judaism. And, and this text is sometimes cited as saying that seems to be what Luke's agenda is because Elijah and Elisha don't just go away from home, they go to Gentiles, or at least they, they benefit in both cases, Gentiles, which is true. Uh, and Shively Smith's comments on this and her commentary are really important to look at, but just to just remember that there's a difference between expansion and rejection. You can expand the circle of blessing without rejecting those at home. Uh, this could be a you just wait kind of a moment as well now that he's getting at. Uh, and I think if he's if he's rebuking the crowd for wanting a special blessing, that's something really different from anti-Judaism. But beware of saying in your sermons, well, the Jews in Nazareth didn't want blessings to go to Gentiles because they were Gentiles and they all hated Gentiles. That's just not the way life ran there for most people. It wasn't that that was necessarily somehow a line that couldn't be crossed. But there were lines of priority and privilege and sequence and stuff like that. Anyway. That's enough Bible 101 for the day. <laughs> All like right, that. Jeremiah. The call of Jeremiah. Yeah, it didn't go so well for him either, did it? <sighs> no. Well, most of the prophets, you know, uh, uh, Ahab was, uh, you know, Ahab and uh, Jezebel, you know, were trying to kill Elijah. And, you know, Jeremiah was thrown down the well and thrown into the jail and they killed one of his friends that was preaching the same thing as him so yeah it's uh that's worth remembering here again this is um i i suspect it's it's paired this way because this is the call you know his inaugural moment where the word is put into his mouth symbolically you know the lord reached out and touched my mouth and said i've put my words in your mouth and so on um but other than that, um, this would be the 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 charisma or you know the the witness of this text really is completely different than than the witness of uh, Luke four I think in a sense because this is a call story uh, this is a chance for people to um, understand that they're called um, one of the things that we did many years ago. Uh, at Luther Seminary, we were part of a, a five seminary grant um, that was Lilly funded to try to help lay people, to help seminaries do a better job of uh, teaching future preachers and pastors and leaders to help the lady understand that they are called to. And at the end of it, what we discovered is no matter how much we talk about it, the laity do not, as by and large, understand themselves as called. Uh, and I went, I remember going out and testing that with some Catholic friends of mine and saying, do you, do you ex experience yourself as called or does your job matter to you? No, no, of course not. You know, it was what they, uh, they laughed at me actually. 
Um, so I do think that this is a chance for people to understand uh, that everybody is called. Now we understand that in baptism. So that really links to the uh, 1 Corinthians 12 and 13 from last week and this week. Um, but it's a chance for people to, to find a way to narrate how they've experienced calls or for the preacher to help people. Uh, and maybe you, you spend time this week um, listening to people if they have a, a, a call story and uh, weaving those pieces. Uh, Caroline uh, referenced uh, a Working Preacher Books podcast. We also uh, uh, a while back did one with Shauna Hannon and her, and her new book in our series called, is it the People's Sermon? Is mm -hmm. that the name of it, Caroline? Yeah, yeah. And where she talks about this method of working the text with people uh, all throughout the week and then having uh, their stories and insights being woven in to, uh, to what you do with, per with permission across, of course, is what I meant to say. I think maybe too, with this passage, uh, maybe less about, uh, you know, a connection to Luke and, and, and maybe not even a sense of call, but maybe another direction, another homiletical direction could be depending on your context and where we are, uh, where we are in how people are navigating the pandemic is uh, to just uh, maybe just to hear the words of promise before I formed you in the womb, I knew you and I consecrated you for a, a kind of purpose. I mean, that does get along the lines of the, of the call vocation as you were talking about Rolf, but also that sense of being known by God uh, is maybe something also that people would really resonate with and need to hear uh, that, that, um, that intimacy of, of knowing, of being known and what that feels like. And uh, particularly in a time when uh, relationships, knowing and relationships have, have, have taken on a different kind of way of maintaining themselves and, and even our own relationship with God, uh, to what extent has become strained because those ways of connecting with God and maintaining our relationship with God have not been able to follow in the same kinds of uh, ways that we've been able to express them uh, traditionally. And so that, that question of, of relationship and being known by God, does God still know me might be something that, that people, that preachers sense is a, an important message for January 30th, 2022. Psalm 71. Yeah, what's your favorite? What's your favorite part of Psalm 71? My favorite part of Psalm 71 is I, uh, well, I like, uh, Lord, I take the very first part, actually, Lord, I take refuge. Uh, let me never be put to shame, but that that sense of ref refuge is um, very attractive to me right now. It feels good. <laughs> A sense of uh, yeah, in in whom do you find, and in what do you find uh, safety and security? Uh, in what and whom do you find a sense of um, not escape, but uh, a place to be, or with whom to be? A relationship to settle into when, uh, when your world is kind of spiraling, or uh, the chaos of our our current lives. So, um, yeah, shelter, <laughs> shelter so we've from got... lives realities. Yeah, so we have the right person commenting on. Uh, Psalm one, uh, excuse me, Psalm seventy one in the uh, website today. It's Jerome Creech. The first line is right. In you, I take refuge. Jerome has not one but two books where he argues that the central theological theme of the Psalms is the Lord as refuge. He did not footnote himself, so he gets double a pluses uh, for the week, but I would point that out if, if anybody's interested in a short book on the theology of the Psalms. Uh, uh, there's one by Jerome about the Lord. I can't remember the title, but uh, it's about the Lord as refuge. And uh, I think the, the obvious reason uh, the Psalm responds to the first lesson is again, you know, this, uh, I've leaned upon you from my birth. It's you who took me from my mother's womb. Um, 
but wait a second, Rolf, do you mean that I like in my answer to your question, like I got the Psalms right? Oh yeah, you totally had a home run. Absolutely. <laughs> totally. Um, and uh, <laughs> there you go. Uh, I also like the um, I also like that the the last line of about my praise is continually of you. Uh, uh, that the idea that our lives that praise praise is deeply woven into the life of faith following God that praise pours out from us whether we're speaking it or not constantly throughout the week um, day and night so I, I love that idea how about you Matt what's your favorite part uh, verse two you can't pick my part because my I didn't part's right. I, I picked verse two I picked the part after <laughs> you but um, yeah, the idea of, of, of God's righteousness being a, a force of deliverance and, and, and rescue. And then also that line, incline your ear to me. I never say words like that. I never say incline your ear to me. I say, listen to me, <laughs> but this is much more poetic and beautiful, but that, you know, it's the, it's one of the, it's one of the, I guess, themes or points of energy in a lot of, of, of the scriptures that gets my attention is contending with God like that, asking God for, um, to, to prove faithful to promises. You know, that I, I like how you pointed out to that, uh, the word incline, right? The image is, is when you're trying to hear somebody, you know, when you lean, lean forward in. and you turn yeah. your ear and you turn your ear toward them, um, that's the that's the image and it is a great image of uh, relationship and truly being heard hmm. i like I, I really like that 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 even that yeah even that image of how you can build that up in a sermon of leaning in and coming near and in my case i have to turn my left ear because my left ear is better than my right ear but that's just me uh but uh but yeah that leaning in and really really listening um that's a that's beautiful. Oh, thanks. I'm gonna think about that this week. So now we get then. I was I was gonna move. Were you about to move to uh, First Corinthians, Carolyn? Yeah. Yes. So I like what the gospel lesson did, which was took the last verse from the last week, and then started this week. So you get verse twenty one twice. I think I would like them to do that with First Corinthians thirteen also. So that 12 is talking about all these gifts that people have, and we all need each other's gifts. But then it says, but strive for the greater gifts, which I think really introduces uh, the so-called love chapter. Um, but it's about three gifts. It's about the three gifts that are greater than, you know, whatever your gift is of being a, you know, teacher or a leader or, or a compassion or a healer. And I think one of the reasons they're greater is because they're available to everyone, every one of us. Uh, I'm not going to have either one of your um, individual gifts that you have, but we can all strive for the gifts of faith, hope, and love. I really like that, Rolf. And I think that's true and really casts a different way of thinking about this chapter or I think an important way entry into this chapter, which is so prevalent, of course, I often, when I'm talking about this chapter and, and, and frequently pairing it with First Thessalonians, where the triad is faith, love, and hope uh, for the Thessalonians, because that's what they need is hope. They need to hear hope. And the Corinthians, of course, need to hear love. And so, but that, but then I'll make some kind of joke about, you know, if you had this at your wedding, it doesn't mean that your wedding didn't count because it doesn't have anything to do with marital, <laughs> marital love. But, but I think that's a really helpful entry into it. And I, I also would point people to the commentary that I, I really appreciated the way in which she, uh, Melanie Howard talks about how Paul urges his audience to pursue love even amid differences and dissent. And uh, that could be a really critical homiletical theme. Uh, again, navigating, inter interpreting, exegeting where your congregation is right now. But then also the other reminder, which I kind of had forgotten about and or I just hadn't paid attention to recently, is the way that love is a verb. 
that rather love is a collection of intentional actions, that love waits patiently, love acts kindly, love is, uh, and, and that just, and what that does for me is highlight the intentionality of love, the activity of love, that, that it's, a, it's a dynamic reality that we, that we move through and we do in our lives. It's not something that's static. And, and we think about the ways in which love uh, and whom we loved and how we have loved over the course of our lifetime, but then just in, in the course of the last couple of years, I think that could be a really rich homiletical direction as well with this passage. It would really shape a, uh, an interpretive, an interpretation that people maybe wouldn't have thought about when it comes to their wedding day on June 24th and 1962 or whatever. Oh, wait, that was my parents. I think when you invite people to imagine love as an agent like that and then invite them to start to fill, fill in some of the blanks or imagine their own verbs of strong actions that they would pair with love or, or attribute to love's agency, that some exciting things can happen with that. I would just quickly highlight the verse, first three verses, which often get overlooked. They're often not, they're quoted in, the, <laughs> in wedding readings and things like that. People wanna jump straight into what love does. But in all of those places, Paul is saying, it doesn't really matter what gifts I possess. Uh, without love there to energize them, they just actually are noise or they cause more trouble, which is, I think, really significant, especially since he's just been talking about what some of the greater gifts are. And he's even kind of ranked gifts back in chapter 12. But then at the end, it's this idea of faith, hope, and love are the things that are going to last, they're going to abide. But I understand this to be that gifts are... The things that help us get through this time of seeing in a mirror dimly, the gifts are the things that are useful when everything is incomplete, when things are still hazy, but the things that actually matter that we train ourselves to learn to do now uh, and to experience now are things like faith, hope, and love. Although those are the things that actually continue and abide. So even though he has talked about the importance of gifts as something from the spirit, as essential to the operating of the body of Christ, they aren't the things that actually matter. At least they're not going to last. As, much, as needed as they are now, they're temporary types of things. I, uh, I, I really like that because verse one, if I speak in the tongues of mortals, that's the gift of tongues. Then second, the gift of prophecy. Third, the gift of revelation or knowledge. Um, I like, you know, you know what sacred song? I like to pair this with Caroline. Did you say Philippians or did you say Thessalonians? I can't remember. Oh, you're muted. You said Thessalonians. Sorry, First Thessalonians, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I like to pair this with that sacred song, What's So Funny About Peace, Love, and Understanding, uh, written by Nick Lowe, but sung by the young angry Elvis. Uh, I like it because that's, a, you know, it's, it's an angry song. And I think Paul's wound up here. Paul's wound up about the divisions and that this is as polemical as any other place in all of the Pauline corpus. I feel like that he is really driving us uh, to, like you both said, to seek to grow into the actions that God associates with um, faith, hope, and love. 